Hello, and welcome to the history of Judaism, the history and story of the Jews told by me, Yossi Silverman, a Jewish educator and licensed tour guide. You are listening to uh, Podcast 8, History and the Jews Reboot. So, you're probably asking yourself, especially if you're one of my regular followers, why have I been quiet for so long? So I'll start with some lame excuses. Firstly, my dog ate the computer. Okay. It was not my dog. It was my child. And he didn't quite eat the computer. He just thought it looked rather thirsty. And he gave it a nice drink. Also, I had the sniffles for about a year. The truth is, I hit a pause in my creativity. A positive one, and then got a whole load of new work and two or three extra jobs. Oh yeah, and a new baby. I also hit a pause due to an issue that I had, and I'd like to focus on that pause. So let's all now hit pause, though not literally, on the podcast and review what has happened. I intended to tell the story of the Jews, and I think I did a fairly good job on that one. Good stories told all round, and they sound kind of, well, Jewish, and everybody's happy. Now, I also intended to tell a historical account, one which a very good friend pointed out I'd also failed at. He also pointed out I managed to tell a Jewish account really only from my narrow part of Judaism. The truth is that's kind of difficult to avoid, really. I'm going to tell things from my perspective, but... I think, uh, let's focus on not telling a historical account. I think that, that would have mitigated that a little bit. And I'll explain what I mean by not telling a historical account. Now, I gave some pretty traditional explanations of Jewish Bible stories that wouldn't have been out of place in a Beit Midrash or a Jewish study hall and absolutely out of place in a history textbook. Now, yes, I threw in a few historical factoids, and I added critical approaches. The main issue is that a history, by its very nature, fairly critical. What I mean by critical deals with things we can measure. Also, very important for history, very, very important, is that you're not just dealing with one source, you're dealing with a number of sources, some of them called primary sources. So you have one source, which you read, and another source, which you read, and you see how do they compare. That's kind of, that's what historians do. Now, it doesn't really discuss belief, unless really we're talking about, like, recorded beliefs, documented beliefs. You'd probably call that theological history. Also, there is a Massive argument among scholars and believers about whether the Bible is a historical source. Now, I'm not going to touch that issue with a 10-foot barge pole unless I want to be arguing with, on one side, the literate lists, on another side, the kind of logical positive is the people who follow the documentary theory of the Bible on the other also, I'm not going to discuss whether the Bible is a historical source, and I'm not going to discuss whether it should be a historical source, because that, that's actually two different questions as well. Uh, both of them really kind of not really what I want to focus on in a discussion of the history of the Jews, okay? What on earth am I going to do if we're not going to discuss that? How are we going to have a coherent discussion? I'll tell you how. Firstly, we could just leave it as you won't find it in the standard syllabus of the only source text. There'd be other ones. I suppose that would be good enough for some people. My other thought is something very important to understand with this whole discussion of the Bible. The Bible is historical, and you say this without any ifs or buts, in certain parts, in bits. 
and we're going to be looking at these verifiably historical bits that that's without any question and how are we going to be using it well this is how we'll use it and this is this is how also we'll avoid this quagmire of an argument about the bible as a historical document so try to think of this like a good documentary i, I was watching a documentary a while ago on the cuban missile crisis and, and you know what they interviewed people they went and interviewed people working with john f kennedy and then they went across the Atlantic and they flew across Europe and they went to the Kremlin and they interviewed people working with Khrushchev. So that's what I'd like to do. Find a part of the Bible where I could interview various historical characters and then go across to the other side and interview historical characters on the other side. So we should be able to go, we could speak to maybe the prophet Jeremiah and ask him what he thinks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then I could jump to an interview with Nebuchadnezzar and ask him what he thinks of the destruction of Jerusalem. So it's not like we're discounting the Bible as a historical text here. We're just not going to rely just on the Bible. And we're also not going to be dealing with this idea of the Bible. Is it a historical text? Isn't it a historical text? No, we're going to go from the first part where we could talk about the Bible as having a mirroring narrative in another source. So that's the focus. If you want to know what my focus is, is having a mirroring narrative in another source if you want to discuss with me at great depth the bible as being as a historical text maybe we'll do that in a different forum but not now that's not for this one anyway this calls for something all the fun movies are doing right now Ta-da! a reboot yes the terms of my reboot a new story of the Jews, starting from a story verifiable to a certain degree. Not meaning to say the other stories might not be true, but this one has to be verifiable uh, with what we have available right now at the present time. Or having a contrasting non-biblical source. Preferably both. Preferably we want evidence, physical evidence, and non-biblical sources and also it has to be part of the jewish story we can't like go off and find another text and you know look at the hammurabi code and discuss that for a long time and not mention anything about judaism so where on earth am i going to start king hezekiah that's right you heard me king hezekiah if you're saying i don't know who he is uh, this is a brilliant opportunity to go and get a Bible and start reading. King Hezekiah, he rules about 300 years after David. He first appears in 2 Kings 18 to 20. He also has a, quite a few non-biblical sources about him as well. Uh, why don't I start before him? There are mention of various kings in different archaeology before it. it says something about King Jehoash or Jehoash it's not a narrative and there are various questions to do with scholarly validity of that there's also a seal from Ahaz again it's a seal it's like a stamp of his it's not a narrative and again there's a whole load of questions about where it was found so no narratives that's the main thing I'm not going to discuss the authenticity of the finds that's again a, a big argument but what we're talking about is no narrative so why do i say there's a narrative with hezekiah so here we can start the story there's vast archaeological evidence he first appears in a long account of an assyrian king called sennacherib or sanharib in the hebrew text this narrative is called the taylor prism or the sennacherib prism it's called a prism but it's carved into a large clay prism it's dated to about 691 BCE. It's viewable in the British Museum. There's also one in the Israel Museum too. 
Furthermore, he is the first king on secular record. This is Hezekiah, who's known now my Akkadian is pretty rubbish, but from what from the uh, translations and transliterations I've read, it says Malik Yahud or Ayud or something like that, King of Judea, or Judah, the Jewish land. This is an awesome place to start a reboot because the first place mentioning a Jewish thing. So our story starts at the end of the seventh century. Now in the Bible. There is a description of a Sargon II conquering the Northern Kingdom. Yes, there were two kingdoms, rather like Game of Thrones. There was a Northern Kingdom, the North, and there was the South. Uh, this is this is from the Bible. This is also borne out in the the archaeology. There's actually two separate, uh, the yet similar cultures. One in the northern part of Israel, one in this southern part around Judah area. So we have this description of Sargon II conquering the northern kingdom. If you go to the British Museum, you can see ancient reliefs from Assyrian palaces depicting this conquest. By the way, when I say reliefs, I don't mean <laughs> that's a relief. I mean uh, pictures, these kind of wall friezes. The Bible describes how the ten northern tribes are carried away in captivity, never to be seen again. But yet again, in the, in this era, in the 7th century, maybe end of the 8th century, there's a definitive change in the settlement in this area. The Bible then describes Sargon II going to Assyria. Now, there's two things going on here. Firstly, there's a rebellion at some point. In, in the area of Babylon, which has to be put down. Also, in the ancient times in this area of the world, wars are not fought in harvest time or the winter. There's actually a, uh, a warfare season, just like today there's a cricketing season. There's, uh, there's a warfare season, except not as, uh, not as civilized as cricket. I, might, I probably don't need to point that out. Then, so Sargon goes home, he then dies. And then his son Sennacherib readies himself to return. And this he does with lightning speed for the ancient world before communication and transport. It takes him a good few years. He's also going to put down this rebellion in Babylon. In the meantime, our story focuses on the king of the second kingdom, the kingdom in the south. Yes, king in the south, Judah. Uh, called in various archaeological sources Yehud or Ayud or however you want to pronounce it. By the way, as we said, entire source of the word Jew. In Hebrew, Jews are called Yehudim. So the people of the kingdom of Yehud. And the king is also based on archaeology. Also, that seems to be the same character as in the Bible. He's known as Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz in the archaeology too. So same bloke. Possibly giving us also a nice bit of uh, mirroring onto the whole story of the dynasty, or dynasty for you Americans, of the House of David. So there we are, there's somewhere we can go from there. And there are various seals and artifacts bearing his name. He seems to have a, made a great attempt to ready his kingdom with much urgency for this conquest. And let's set the scene. We've got the massive Assyrian army heading towards Judah, going at lightning speed, taking years. So this gives Hezekiah, who's probably getting very scared, a very, very scary group of people, the Assyrians. They prided themselves on viciousness in battle. So Hezekiah is going to ready his town, Jerusalem, for Sennacherib. So we have a, an accounting chronicles of what Hezekiah is saying. He says in the book of Chronicles, why should I leave water in the hills for my enemies to drink from? No, I will stop up the water. Now you can hear the urgency in his voice. In fact, in and around Jerusalem, you can see the attempts to reinforce Jerusalem, but also specifically to hide the water. So what does Hezekiah do, or his workers do? So in the city of David Archaeological Park, 
which you're more than welcome to come and visit with me, you can see a half kilometre twisting underground tunnel built to hide the water from a besieging army and bring water inside the city, inside the city walls. And this is all from the 7th century. There's a 7 metre thick defensive wall, also 7th century, and jugs from Hezekiah with Hezekiah's stamp on it, his logo. He actually had a logo. I'll try and get that on the website. Uh, used to collect money for building all these defences. He sent these jugs out to collect money. So Hezekiah is building all these defences. He's getting ready for the scary Assyrian menace coming his way. There's vast evidence of a lot more of these defensive measures. Now, the response from Isaiah, or Yeshayahu in Hebrew, is crushing. He accuses Hezekiah of blasphemy of doubting God. Surely all Hezekiah needed to do was trust in the Lord, not in defensive walls and your hidden water sources. Now, by the way, that it's possible to have some kind of evidence connected with uh, Isaiah 2. There's some finds connected with him. Uh, within the last few years, a seal was found in an archaeological dig near the southern wall of the Temple Mount with the name Isaiah or Yeshayahu on it and the next word on the seal is not so clear but looks like the letters corresponding to an N, a V sound and a Y sound possibly spelling out the words Navi or Prophet. Many scholars tend to talk about Isaiah and Hezekiah as being, let me make this clear, historical actors i'm not talking about real people or not real people i'm sure there's many people even living in the world right now who you might not be able to verify their existence uh, as historical actors or based on lack of evidence of their existence i'm talking about people like napoleon or like uh Peter the Great, people who who we have sources talking about them and they did this and they affected world history in this way or national history in this way. So the scholars talk about Isaiah and Hezekiah as historical actors. In terms of the stamp, there, there's a few questions about it, whether it's actually referring to the Isaiah or just an Isaiah or the Isaiah, the prophet or just a prophet called Isaiah. That's all part of the scholarly story. So you've got Isaiah giving rebuke to Hezekiah. And in the end, Hezekiah repents. But he also prays to God to come and save him. Finally, the Assyrians arrive. I'm glad with all this building we've been doing. And they cut a sway through Judah. In the British Museum and Israel Museum, you can see depicted the sieges of Judean towns such as Lachish which is a ruin you still see today and you still see the remains of a massive ancient siege ramp and it's littered with uh, distinctive Assyrian arrowheads. In the relief in the museum, you can see an insight into why the urgency that Hezekiah has. And why, why, is, why is Assyria so, so scary? Why are we doing all these big works of reinform reinforcements? The Assyrians seem to revel in depicting their sieges in great detail. Probably to dissuade potential enemies. There's a depiction in the siege of Lachish, the relief of the siege of Lachish, of multiple slaves being taken. Then what looks like it's either crucifixion or multiple captives being flayed alive. And then there's some pretty gruesome looking impaling of prisoners or prisoners who have previously been impaled. Lovely. So everybody's scared. And then the Syria arrives. And then Sennacherib sends his commander, Rav Shake, to taunt the Judeans. By the way, good taunting. This is possibly a standard part of ancient warfare. Homer has a bit of taunting. I think Herodotus might do too. It's a kind of psychological warfare. Uh, so he starts by speaking Hebrew. And the guards say, no, no, please don't speak Hebrew. Don't speak Hebrew. Speak of something we don't understand. They beg him to speak Assyrian. 
and he carries on in Hebrew so he can be understood, of course. And he calls out to them and he invites them to follow him to a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a direct insult against Judah, which is supposed to be the land flowing with milk and honey. Instead, he means Nineveh, capital of Assyria, the land flowing with milk and honey. And he then says, this is the alternative. If you're not coming with me to Nineveh, you can sit in this stage and starve and end up, in his own, the words in the biblical text, drinking your own urine and eating your own feces. They say manners have gotten worse over the generations and the people are scared and frightened. And Isaiah mounts the battlements, calls out to God, and he prophesies his meaning again to some kind of meditative state of rapture and ecstasy. He calls out all night. Very comforting for the Judeans. This is their connection to the divine. And for the Assyrian, probably fairly scary. In the morning, scripture tells us the Assyrians miraculously disappeared. Oh, come on! I hear you say that. That's, that's not historical. Well, there's at least one source that corroborates this. There's the Greek historian Herodotus. Records the story and he has big rats appearing in the Assyrian camp and the Assyrians leaving. Yeah, I mean, you're probably saying to yourselves, maybe his Herodotus read the Bible. Uh, or maybe, you know, can we, can we have something more solid there in, in terms of a primary source talking about this event so this is where i'm going to send our intrepid reporter off all the way to Nineveh to have an interview with the emperor sennacherib himself because we don't have uh, cameras at this time in history i'm going to send some guy with a nice lump of clay to make into a prism because we do have an account of this in the Taylor prism so Emperor Sennacherib tell me what happened to King Hezekiah and Sennacherib describes himself cutting a swathe across the country of Judah taking many cities captive taking slaves captive destroying the land but then he says and as for king hezekiah king of yahud i left him locked up like a bird in a cage so what does that mean well it could be some kind of excuse it could be like we didn't defeat him but that's okay we left him far worse we lost we can't admit it. Or it could be. We actually left the force there to keep him under control, a garrison. Uh, there might be evidence of this. A place in the south of Jerusalem called Kibbutz Ramat Rachel. It has some fantastic archaeology next to it. It's not conclusive, but it's a possibility. Uh, there could be something else that this means. It's a very enticing story. It's a story pardon the phrase a David and Goliath story little Judah facing off against the Assyrian Empire it could be considered to be a story that typifies the Jewish people they fought us they nearly wiped us out we survived you're going to get this a lot in this podcast that's a, a motif so we leave you with the Jewish people, at least the kingdom of Yahud with their distinctive houses and culinary culture. We have a story of survival against surprising odds. We leave you with an Assyrian empire. We leave you with the, the thing which all good stories need, an evil empire. And next week we're going to understand a little bit more about, on one hand, the kingdom of Yahud. What happens to the Assyrian empire? It's decline. And what replaces them? So, I've been updating my podcasts recently, and I've noticed something very serious missing. 
And that serious thing that is missing is you. You are missing from my podcast. What do I mean by this? I'd like to see more comments. I'd like to have a conversation with you about how things are going, how things are going in terms of both the technical things and also the content. What do you think? Do you agree with me? Do you have better knowledge that I don't know about? Make a comment, make an input both on the SoundCloud page, on my YouTube page or Facebook. You can look for me on Scout Israel. If you want to contribute towards actually making a change in the podcast, that it would involve a monetary contribution, which you can do at co, ko-fi.com slash Scout Israel. See uh, the show notes in all my different media in the SoundCloud page and uh, YouTube for the precise URL. Remember, sharing is caring. The best thing you can do is share the podcast on any of your social media. Thank you very much. You've been his- listening to The History of Judaism, The History and Story of the Jews. For more information, please visit my website, scoutisrael.com. You can also search for me on Facebook. Just type in Scout Israel. That should bring you to my page. And you can also see me on Instagram, Yossi Tour Guide, and see some of the lovely pictures I've uploaded. It's been wonderful starting a new podcast again. Stay tuned for the next one, which should be out sometime before the next decade. Newsflash, you can also check YouTube out. I've uploaded some videos to YouTube under the name Scout Israel. So go to Scout Israel on YouTube.